Hey everyone, and welcome to Austintronics. In the last video, I gave a general overview of typical software components you'd find in operating systems. I also showed you what specific OS components I plan on using for Robodog and how all the software components interact and flow through the Zinc chip architecture on the Zybo board. We also installed Xilinx tools and created a bitstream in Vivado for the PL and a first stage bootloader in Vitus for the PS. Now let's jump straight where we left off and move on to building the second stage bootloader for the system, which is U-Boot. The U-Boot source code that I got is from Xilinx's GitHub repository. You can simply perform a git clone command of the repository and place it anywhere, but I'm doing a git submodule add command here because I'm already working in the git repository. The submodule add just lets git know that I want to make the Xilinx U-Boot repo a submodule of my existing git repo. That way, when you go to my GitHub and clone my Robodog project, you'll pull the source code from their repo as well. Once this finishes downloading from GitHub, cd into the uboot Xilinx directory and run the source command on Vivado's settings64.sh script. If you have a 32-bit computer, you'd run the 32-bit version script instead. This will set the environment variables in your current shell so that when you build uboot, the build system will know where to find all the proper tools. Next, you should check out the 2019.2 version of uboot. For some reason, later versions of uboot, at least at the time of making this video, don't have the configuration files necessary to build the Zybo Z7 target. I've also tested and verified this version of uboot in the past with the Zybo board, so we'll be using this version going forward. Because this version of uboot has the proper config files for our target, we can just run make zinc Zybo Z7 config, and the uboot build system will set that config file to be used when we build uboot. The last thing to do is just build uboot with the following command. This command says to build the uboot source code with the arm nun eabi cross compiler using all of the available CPU cores on your computer. Once the build is finished, you'll see a uboot.elf file in the uboot Xilinx directory. We'll eventually need to tell Vitus where the uboot.elf is located, along with the bitstream and first stage bootloader, so that Vitus can create a unified boot.bin file, which combines the bitstream and all the bootloaders into one file. But before we can do that, let's also create the Linux kernel binary and DTB while we're in the command line here. So let's move back one directory and get another one of Xilinx's repos, but this time we're going to be getting the Linux kernel source code. And again, using the submodule add command here. Downloading this repo might take a while since there's a lot that goes into the Linux kernel source. After about 5 to 10 minutes, everything should be downloaded. And similar to what we did with uBoot, you want to tell the kernel build system what configuration you want to use. CD into the Linux Xilinx directory and run the following make command to tell the build system to use the Xilinx Zinc configuration file. Once the configuration file is in place, run the following command to tell the build system that your target architecture is an ARM and you want to use an arm nun eabi cross compiler to build the Linux kernel source on all of the cores available on your computer. This can usually take anywhere between a minute to half an hour depending on the specs of your computer. Once the build is finished, you can find the kernel binaries in the arc arm boot directory. However, the type of format that we need for the kernel binary isn't here. The image file that you see here is the uncompressed version of the Linux kernel binary. And the Z image file here is the compressed version of the Linux kernel binary. But what we really need is the compressed version of the Linux binary that also has some specific information in it for uBoot so that uBoot will know how to pass off control to the Linux kernel. The file name that has that is called uImage, and that's not here. uImage adds some header information before the compressed kernel binary section of the binary file. And it will indicate things like version numbers, loading position of memory, how many bytes are in the image, your compression type, and so on. To make the uImage binary, you can run the following command. This command tells the Linux kernel build system to build the uImage binary and place the load address of 8000 hex in the uImage header. This load address specifies where in RAM the kernel binary should be placed by uBoot for the CPUs to start executing it. For an ARM Linux kernel, the recommended load and entry point address is usually 8000 hex from the start of physical memory, so that's where we'll place our kernel binary. Once the build is finished, if you look into the arc arm boot directory again, you'll now see the uImage there. In addition to the Linux kernel binary that you built, you also already built the DTB file that you need for your target. This is located at arc arm boot DTS. The DTB file you want to use is right here. 
And here's the DTS file that was used to generate the DTB file in case you wanted to make changes to the DTB. I'll show you how to do this in the advanced configuration section a little later in this video. Now that we have our bitstream, first stage bootloader, uboot, Linux kernel, and the DTB, let's move on to generating the root file system. We're going to use a build system from the Yocto project called Pocky to do this. There are a couple of other build systems out there that you can use to help you build a root file system, like Petalinux or Build Root, but I find that Yocto gives you much more visibility and flexibility in what you can add to your custom root file system. And it's also widely used throughout the embedded system industry, so it's a useful tool to learn. Let's first start with downloading all the dependencies for your system. These dependencies can be found in the Yocto manual, so I'll include a link in the description so you can copy and paste them from the manual instead of typing everything out here. Next, you need to grab the Pocky Git repository from Yocto's website. Just type in Yocto in the search bar, and it should be the first result you get. Scroll down and click the button that says BSPs and Archived Releases. Instead of grabbing the latest branch, we're going to grab the Zeus branch. I tried all the other branches ahead of Zeus up to the master branch and had issues building the root file system for the Zybo board. So we're just going to stick with the Zeus branch for now. Now we're going to copy this git clone command and paste it into the terminal. And I want to go back up a directory, so I'll cd into Zybo Z7-20. And again, like the other times, I'm going to do a git submodule add command instead of a git clone. Once that's downloaded, you'll want to cd into the directory and source some environment variables for the Pocky build system with this command, similar to what we did with the Xilinx tools. After that command, install the dependencies to run Toaster, which is Yocto's web server for configuring and interacting with the build system. You can do that with the following command. And now we can start the Toaster web server with this command. If everything was successful, the web server should now be running on your local machine at port 8000. To view the web page, open up a web browser and type in localhost colon 8000. You'll be presented with this introduction page. Now it's possible to do everything via the command line instead of using the Toaster web interface. And using the command line is a very good way to automate things with Pocky. But using this web interface is a bit more intuitive when first introducing someone to this massive build system. So we'll stick to using Toaster for this video. Create a new Toaster project by clicking Create Your First Toaster Project to Run Manage Build. Then name the project whatever you want. I'll name mine RoboDog. Change the specific release branch to Zeus, then hit the Create Project button. This is the main homepage for your Yocto project. The first thing you'll want to do is change the machine architecture type to Zybo Zinc 7 so that everything you build with Pocky will be for that specific architecture. Click on the Edit icon, then click View Compatible Machines. Search for Zybo, and you should see the Zybo Zinc 7 machine. Add the Meta Xilinx layer so Pocky can get the Xilinx related elements and scope, then you can click Select Machine. Now Pocky knows it will be building for the Zybo Zinc 7 platform. Next thing we'll do is add some environment variables so that Pocky will know that we want things built and configured a certain way. The first environment variable we'll add is a license variable. I'm going to put GPLv3 here, but if you want a different license associated with what you're building, you may want to have a closer look at the documentation for this variable. Also, I've experienced Pocky failing builds if this license variable is not set, so you should at least make sure that you include this variable. The rest of the variables I'm setting here involve the configuration for a runtime package management system so that you can add software packages to your root file system while your system is running. These configurations get used when you're building the package management tool for your root file system, like apt, dnf, or yum. So if you don't care about putting a package management system on your OS, you don't need to add these variables. If you do want a package management system, you'll need to change the package feed URI's value to the IP address that will be hosting your software packages. This variable tells the package management tool on your OS where to point to to get the software packages. This will usually be on the same computer you have your Pocky build system on, since Pocky is the thing that's generating the software packages for you. But you can host the built software packages somewhere else and then point the IP address to that instead. You can also always change this IP address later on in your OS within the package management config files. I'll go over how to do this as well as implementing the package management system on your Pocky build computer a little later in this video. For now, let's move on to actually making the root file system. It would be a pain if we had to construct all the pieces of a root file system from the ground up. Luckily, Yocto has a bunch of pre-made root file systems you can choose as a baseline to build up from, or to even just use as is if you wanted. 
To customize one of Yocto's baselines, we'll first need to choose which baseline that we want to start from and then compile it with the Pocky build system. First, go to Image Recipes and then search for Core Image. We'll be choosing Yocto's Core Image Minimal Dev Recipe, which is a bare bones image with just enough stuff in it to bring up the system and allow some basic development work. Pocky is currently going out and collecting all of the software packages that it needs and is building it from source, so naturally, this will take a while to build. This took my computer about 30 minutes to run. Here I'm running HTOP, which shows my CPU utilization on all the cores as the image builds. This image that Pocky is building will contain the root file system, along with a bunch of other potentially useful artifacts to help bring up your embedded system. Some of these artifacts we've already manually built ahead of time, like Yubu and the Linux kernel, but there are some other things like a U-boot environment text file, which we'll take advantage of later in this video. But you might be asking yourself, if Yocto already generates the U-boot and Linux kernel for me, then why do I need to go through the trouble of making it manually? Well, from my experience, it's usually less of a headache in the long run to manually grab and make U-boot and the Linux kernel yourself. Since you know exactly where that source code is coming from, there are less chances you'll run into issues when placing it on your embedded system. Or if you do run into an issue, you'll have more visibility into the software components to potentially do something about it. It's probably also worth mentioning that you can make your own image recipes from scratch in Yocto instead of using baselines like what we're doing here, but that requires a lot more in-depth knowledge of Yocto and the Pocky build system, which is far too outside the scope of this video. Once the build is finished, you might notice some warnings. I'll usually get a few warnings here every time I build, but as long as the build completes, the warnings are usually nothing to worry about. For reference, here are what my warnings are. Going back, if we click on the image that we just built, Toaster displays some nice statistics about the build, including a rough summary of your configuration, what tasks were executed, how many recipes and packages were built, and what artifacts were built. There are other performance metrics about the build as well, like the time each task took, the CPU usage for each task, and how much disk space each task took up. There's also a whole bunch of other stats that you can look at about the build as well. Something I find really cool is that you can look at your directory structure right from within Toaster for what your root file system will consist of. For example, you can expand bin and see many of the binary executables that you'll have in your root file system. Now that we've built up Yocto's baseline image, we'll make a new custom image from that baseline. Head to the new custom image tab and search for the core image minimal dev image that you just built. Now type in a name for your new custom image you're about to make. I'll call mine Robodog Image Minimal Dev, then click Create Custom Image. Now we can start adding individual software packages on top of the baseline image we built. To find these packages, click on your project name at the top and go to Software Recipes on the side toolbar. I know I'll want to interface with the Zybo board remotely over Ethernet, so one of the things that I want to get is DropAir, which is a lightweight SSH and SCP implementation. I'll build this recipe, and after a few minutes, you'll have a drop bear binary that's compatible with your platform. I'll also probably be running some Python scripts on Robodog, so I'll get Python 3. Same process here, we just search for what we want, then build the recipe. So another thing that I'll want is DNF for my package management tool, so I'll build that one too. Once you're done building everything that you want, Go to the Configuration tab and go to Custom Images on the side toolbar. You should see your custom image you named. Click on your image and find all the packages you built. So one of the packages that I built was DropBear, so once you find it, add that package to your root file system. Here you can keep track of how big your file system is getting as you add more software packages to it. Now I also compiled Python 3 and I want to include that, so let's look for Python 3 and add that to your root file system. And for DNF, looks like that's already automatically added. Once you've added all the software packages you wanted to your root file system, go ahead and click Build Robodog Image Minimal Dev. Once that's done building, we can click on our custom image and check out various stats like we did with the baseline image. Now that we have all of our OS components, let's prepare an SD card from scratch so that it's properly partitioned and formatted. For reference, I'm using a Transcend USB 3 dongle with a SanDisk Ultra micro SD card for loading the root file system and OS components for the Zybo board. Before I plug this in, let's open up a new terminal and look at the current memory devices connected to the system in slash dev. Here we can see there is SDA, SDB, and SDC, but there is no SDD. Now let's plug in the SD card. If we look into slash dev again, 
we now see that there is an SDD memory device that currently has a single partition that's mounted on the computer. Let's unmount that partition by running the umount command, then let's run the fdisk command with sudo on the SDD memory device. fdisk is just a utility that will help you partition and format your SD card, but there are other tools that you can use to do this instead, like gparted. If we type in the letter P here, we can print general info about this memory device. We can see that it's about 15 gigabytes and that it currently has a single Linux partition that utilizes the entire 15 gigabytes of space. We'll need to format the SD card in two partitions for the Zybel board. One for the root file system, which I'll call the root file system partition, and another for everything else, which I'll call the boot partition. Let's first make the boot partition. We can start by making sure everything is deleted from the SD card. You can do this by typing in D. Because there's only one partition, it knows to delete that partition. Next, create a new partition by typing in N, then select P for primary partition. Next, you can just press enter since we want to start with partition one and the default value if you don't type in anything is one. We can also press enter again since starting the first sector at 2048 is fine. However, we want the first partition to be 32 megabytes, so we'll type in plus 32 M here and press enter. We want to remove the signature here, so we'll select Y for yes. Now let's see what we have so far by typing in P. Notice how the first partition only takes up 32 megabytes, but before it took up the entire size of the SD card. Also notice the type of partition is Linux. However, we actually don't want the first partition to have a Linux type. We want it to have a W95FAT32LBA type. To change this, type T and press enter. Then type in L to see a list of all the codes for all the different types you can make a partition. C is the code that we need to use for a W95FAT32LBA type, so we'll type in C and press enter. If we enter in P again, you'll see the type has now changed to what we wanted. Next is the second partition for the root file system. Let's type in N, then P, press enter since we want to work with the second partition. Starting the first sector at 67,584 is fine, since that just leaves off where the first partition ended, so push enter. And we want to take up the rest of the SD card for the second partition, which is the root file system. So we'll just press enter again for the default, then press Y here to remove the signature. Let's see what we have so far by entering in the letter P. The type for partition 2 is correct. We actually do want Linux here. But if we didn't say Linux, you could do what we did before, which was press T, then L to find the type. Linux is type 83, so we'll just type in 83, then press enter. Pressing P for the last time just to make sure this is how we want to partition the SD card. And everything looks good. So let's enter in a W for write the changes to the SD card. Please make absolutely sure that this is the right memory device you're wanting to modify before you press W, because if you choose the wrong one, you could delete your entire drive. The last step we need to do with the SD card is format both partitions. We can do this by simply running sudo makefs dot msdos slash dev slash sdd1 for the first partition and then sudo makefs dot ext4 slash dev slash sdd2 for the second partition then that's it your sd card is now ready for the zybel board you can go to your file manager and you should see two partitions one that's roughly 34 megabytes for the boot partition and the other that's roughly 16 gigabytes for the root file system this is a good stopping point for now, because in the next video, we'll be taking everything that we've done so far, putting it on an SD card, and booting the Zybo board with it. I'll also show you some cool tricks and how you can manage your software packages on your new OS, and some advanced configurations with some of the OS components if you want to do something more custom. That'll do it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.